Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Daily Threat. No blue skies all no, week. No blue skies, gray skies. All week. No blue skies. No, a whole week. All we see is gray. You know, gray goes very good with blue. But um, it would be nice if it was partly cloudy. Even mostly cloudy would be acceptable. But just this, looks like there's nothing going this on. Grayness. Up there. What is the message they're sending to us? I think you got to go on an airplane just to just to tell us that the sky just, is still up. Just there. to get above the the clouds. Just get above the clouds. Above five thousand feet. You're going. You're going somewhere soon. No, you're going to Florida. Yes, I'm going to Florida. God willing, on Sunday morning. Very nice. To uh, to Listen, that's the Beach. Li- you know, that's the life. That's uh, the life. Is that the life? Uh, what can I tell you? Um, my parents used to go to Florida, so I'm really. Just, Following in their footsteps. Your you parents know? just go to Florida? I didn't know that. Yeah, they went once or twice uh, in the winter season. And it's a, it was a different Takufa. It was a different era uh, uh, back then. But um, my father made sure to, to go in the heart of winter to get away for a few days, seven days, ten days, you know, where it was, uh, where the weather was good. And um, what can I tell you? I have the same inclination. And... Um, you know, travel is uh, is what it is today. It's been it's uh, air travel is easier than traveling by car. Yeah, as you know, you know? absolutely. Look at so, look at your Tillam project. You yeah. could you could go through the whole safe at Tillam in a drive to Lakewood. You could, you could finish maybe twice. Yeah, come, um, if you come home. So Pesach is coming up. Well, Perm is also coming up, but Pesach's coming up, and you see a lot of those ads already for Pesach. A lot of Pesach well, hotels opening, uh, you know, around the world. You have to understand that it's not just a matter of the Pesach season, which used to be, you know, huge. And it's still huge, but um, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Number one, we're in the post-COVID uh, era. Mm-hmm. That's number one. COVID destroyed that industry, uh, the the kosher hotel for Pesach industry, and in a way, it's still crawling back. And at the same time, if you listen to the news, if you read the news, they're talking about a new variant. Are they? Yes. I didn't hear that. The IB 1.5 or the IBB. There's two different types of variants. I think you just... No, no, very... Well, they just stop listening to the news. Very... Oh, yeah, that's, get, a good, that's a good option. Get your news from us. We'll, we'll give you what, what actually is important. It's a good thing we're in the news business, uh, but it's an idea to stop listening to the news and... I think so. Just guess what's happening. Listen, uh, uh, I mean, if Tali Horowitz, he said, works for you know, J.P. Morgan, he said when he started being successful is when he stopped reading the Wall Street Journal. And uh, he worked on Wall Street, and uh, yeah, because when all you read was bad news and bad news and bad news, how can you be successful then? If they yeah, start talking about a variant, everyone's gonna walk around thinking they're getting it. Yeah, but news. First of all, news dictates the direction of the markets. So if the guy's in the markets, I don't know how he's functioning without knowing what's in the news. He, kn- you he know knows what? what's going on. He's just not reading the Wall Street Journal opinion. It, it's all opinions. all right. So don't, don't read the opinions. You know, the, the 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 stock market, by the way, is like taking the temperature of the country on a daily basis. That's how the country feels. The stock market is a huge thing, but at the end of the day, it reacts to news. What's the Jewish equivalent of a stock market? Um, I don't know. Shema Shas? I don't know. <laughs> that happened once every eight years. I don't know. A daily don't Jewish know. equivalent of the stock market. I don't know. Daily Jewish equivalent of the stock market? What? The stock market opens up every morning and it closes every night. What in the from world is that? Well, first of all, you know, uh, the world you at said large. said it takes the temperature of the, of the world. Yes, what does that in the from world? The world at large is a physical material world. The essence of the from world is something that you can't see. It's uh, it's invisible. It's spiritual. It's it's tefillah. It's davening in the morning. It's how you daven. It's your thought process. It's what role studying, whether it's tafiyomi or chumash. So really, it's the same thing. We have a we have a, sto- a stock market, a spiritual stock market, but you can't measure it. At the, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I don't think you could say that the, the market was up two hundred points or down five hundred points. Well, you know, if you did, if you if you did good things today, if you were kind no, to boy, people, talk, I'm talking about the stock market is a result of a communal effort. It's how the country feels overall. I'm talking about millions of people that are investors. Um, I know, but a communal, no. but 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 what dictates the like? You know, if let's say Twitter or Amazon just starts selling their stock, it's going to tank the market. And it's same thing with the spiritual stock market. If people are, you know, if each person in their own life is just like tanking, they 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 reflect, I guess, on the on the communal. Yeah, but we're not talking about individual. Everyone has an accounting individually. You're right on those things, but we're talking about 
What's the what's the grand total at the end of the day? What's the sum total at the end yeah. of the day? Are we up three hundred or right now? Like the stock market's uh, down. I don't, I don't know. And you have to understand, you know. And you could, you, if you want to know how powerful Tefillah and Torah is, I'll tell you how powerful it is. A small minority of Jews in the world actually daven every yeah. day and have a commitment to to study Torah, which connects them to Kaddish Baruch Hu. It's also it's also so, as, pow- as it's as powerful as you as you think it is. So, it, but the the fact of the matter is that it's designed, I think, by 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 Hashem. Uh, uh, I think the 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 whole design of the world is that Am Yisrael is by design tiny minority of people, and they have a tremendous koch in the world. I yeah. mean, I don't want to get back to uh, it's about Ben Gavir, who's one of my favorite people. But one of your favorite guy, people, the guy, yeah, he's one of my favorite people. Why is he one of your favorite people? Well, first of all, th- there's no baseball season now, so there's nothing to talk about. Nah, he's getting yeah. slammed. <laughs> he's one of your favorite people. Yeah, he is. He he. he he, of course, he stands up for what he believes in. So I don't and, know if he's and, one of your favorite people. He's and, really and one of your favorite right. You know, yeah, he is. Uh, he stands up. Not, it, before he became a Knesset member. Oh, okay. When he became a Knesset member, he stood up for what was right. Now he's just he, causing issues. And he defended, he defended Jews who want to live where they want to live. There isn't, a, there, isn't a, there isn't an ethnic minority in the world that can't decide where they want to live and just live there. No one's going to... Uh, have a UN resolution uh, saying that they shouldn't live there. No such thing. So, what do you want to say about him? What do I want to say about him? Before he became a Knesset member, he was, he's an attorney. Mm-hmm. He lives in Kiryat Arba, which is the community attached to Hebron, and 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 he believes in Am Yisrael. He believes in the Jewish people and and in the land of Israel. And you talk about how physical things get attached to what are, what are spiritual things and, and material or physical things have in common. Uh, if you want to understand that, if you can't see, if you think they're parallel things that never meet, all you have to do is look at Eretz Yisrael. That's a that's a, a physical geographic place, and it's 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 uh, it's full of um, the energy of, uh, of of holiness and spirituality. So, how do you reconcile that? How do you fit those two things together? There's yeah. only one way to fit those things two two things together. And, that is to be in Eretz Yisrael and walk in Eretz Yisrael and breathe in, breathe in the sweet air. Absolutely, you know, one of the, on the heels of discussing the spiritual stock market for Klal Yisrael, I would hope it's it's trending upwards, mainly because of how amazing uh, we are as a, as a nation, as a community. Um, since Matzah Shabbos, you know, unfortunately last week there was someone who passed away, uh, Rabbi Rami Miller, uh, who had an illness you know, from Bayswater. And he left behind a wife and, and a, a few children. Um, and the community came together, led by many Askanim, Baruch Bar Bender, and others. Um, and they they put on this effort to raise money for the family. Uh, his condition, I think, made it complicated to have good life insurance. Um, and okay. mm-hmm. they raised, since Masi Shabbos, over $1.4 million dollars. And that is done with zero dollars spent on advertising, on, on marketing, which is remarkable. That's word of mouth, people in the community. Let's just, we need to take care of this family. Well, another example, of, well, of course we're helping out. Mika Abchi Yisrael, that comes under that heading where people can pull together and make a remarkable, uh, reach a remarkable um, uh, goal, a remarkable objective. Uh, not to change the subject, but in a similar vein, that football player that got injured. Yeah, you know, it's funny. His I, I, uh, what's his name again? Demar Hamlin. Demar Han- Hamlin. Yeah. Demar Hamlin was had a fundraiser for his for his community toy drive for his toy, toy drive. drive for Christmas, right? And up until he got injured, they raised two and a half thousand dollars. That was the goal to raise twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah, and they, so they reached the goal of twenty five hundred dollars. Then he became the most talked about personality in the news, and and the, which, the, by the way, they say this as of this morning, he. I don't. I, I don't. I, I can't. I, I would like to say these reports are confirmed, but I I suggest confirming them uh, for your own. But they say that he is now awake and he's been making remarkable remarkable progress. Yeah, they say that his. They think he didn't have any neurological damage. Right, which, which is, is what which is they amazing. Were afraid of, um, but they. Well, but yeah, the, they raised over six million dollars. Six million dollars. And you look at the you look at the the list of the donors. You see, you know, obviously, if you, if you know sports, you see Tom Brady, twenty five thousand uh-huh. dollars, and Aaron Rodgers. You know, but if you look in the front world, yeah. the people it's more than twenty five thousand dollars they're giving. You'd think Tom Brady. You know, you're you're on uh, uh, you're on these hundred million dollar marketing contracts. You know, give some icer. Come on. Um, well, that, but it's really it's, it's the, remarkable what's going on. The the, the concept of mice really doesn't exist in the in the non Jewish world. Can you imagine if it did. 
It's a, it's, it's a. Being a homo people. I'm not saying it's a foreign concept. I'm saying, you know, when, when like presidents or people that run for governor or mayor, it's not required. Uh, I mean, it's controversial now because of the Trump tax returns that were in the news. But they generally, to demonstrate what good upstanding citizens they are, they release their tax returns. Yeah. And they're not ashamed to, you know, to have made $782,000. And it would look at charity that donated $300 to charity. It's so, it, but it's, it's like... <laughs> It's so terrible, huh? But they're not. But they're not embarrassed because that's the routine. That's that's the routine. Or well, one of the I don't know who it was. Somebody was running for governor or mayor of New York, and they put down the charity. They donated like old clothing worth eighteen hundred dollars. They took a tax deduction. It's a charitable Listen, contribution. Listen, you walk in Dunkin' Donuts, it has like that St. Jude thing, and you can put in a quarter, <laughs> right? You put in a quarter. Try yeah. giving a guy, go to Shiner Show, and try giving a guy who's collecting a quarter. Yeah. See what I happens. give it back to you. But, um, but you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I think I posted this on Meaningful Minute the other day on status. Obviously, you know, the DeMar Hamlin situation and the money that's being raised, it's not like a Mikam Yisrael because it's not Kla Yisrael. But at the same time, you know, with all the negative news that's out there constantly, how society is crumbling and the world is falling apart. It's nice. It's nice to see a, a good news story. It's nice to see humanity uh, come together with over 250,000 people giving money in, in that moment. I, I think a moment that a football player goes into cardiac arrest on a football field and you might be thinking, why are we talking about a football player? This is, you know, part of Daily Thread, meaningful minute. It's not meaningful. I'll tell you why it is. You had a football player that went into cardiac, cardiac arrest in the field. You have a whole world, which everyone thinks is going more to the left and to the left and to the left and moving away from prayer and moving away from prayer and moving away from God. Mm -hmm. And what happened in that moment is players got down on their knees and started praying. The fans in the stands that started praying. Right. Like we discussed the other day on this podcast. And what are they doing? They're giving charity. People are firmer than they think. Whether you're Christian, Muslim, Jewish, or you, you, you say that you don't believe in anything or any God. People at the end of the day are firmer than they think. Um, and and uh, it's good for humanity. Well, it's, good, uh, it's good for humanity that, that this is happening, that uh, we see that. I think we pointed it out here. There was a Supreme Court case last year. About the, yeah. The high school football coach, I believe, of the high, where he uh, used to go to the center of the field, either before or after the game, I think after the game, right? And he knelt down and he prayed. And the school, you know, fired him because he was mixing up uh, education with the religion, which is a dangerous combination to them. And he took this case to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said he has the right to pray. But, you know, that was a big controversy. One guy wants to go out to the 50-yard line and, you know, and, and kneel down. He's a Christian. Kneel down and, and, and do a silent prayer yeah. uh, to be grateful or thankful for his team's success, his victory, whatever was going on. I'm not sure. And then almost reflexively the other night when – Mr. Hamlin became injured. You saw a hundred players, you know, hundred players and in the stands gathered, as well. gathered in uh, in uh, in um, in prayer. And the LC the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, which is very careful about getting religion involved uh, in society, didn't sue anybody. You know, why don't they sue the NFL for having this type of prayer? You know uh, why? Because because they would be was, obliterated if they did. Because it was a moment. <laughs> it was a moment of dire need. And that's what people do when they're in need. Um, you know, transitioning to the next story, it's a perfect, uh, it's a perfect story. I, I saw on LinkedIn from Sivia Cohn, who's the chief marketing strategist for 14 Minds. Okay. Um, she writes, our community is really great at crisis. When something terrible happens, there is no shortage of organizations, communities, or individuals that are willing to step up and help. But what about preventing some of these emergencies from happening in the first place? Rather than jumping from one crisis to the next, wouldn't it be incredible if our community could come together to actually address the greater underlying issues. While some tragedies cannot be prevented, many can. With the proper education, treatment, resources, awareness, or support, I've met some incredible people focusing on these types of preemptive projects, but I think there is so much more that, that can be done. From a marketing standpoint, it may not be as dramatic or compelling, but the potential for a long-term result is incomparable. Um, is incomparable. Who do you know that is working on the, on the prevention angle? Tag them below. Do you know anybody... And I, and I hear her point. There's, you know, there's some things we can't prevent. Unfortunately, people get sick and they need to be Right. Unfortunately, people get sick. They need RCS. You know, it's mm -hmm. hard. You know, you could encourage, uh, you could encourage exercise. You can encourage things, you know, but um, for example, you know, and obviously Hashem runs the world and everything is, is, you know, is destined. I, I know, you know, when people, when it comes to poverty, there's an organization RSK that, that uh, stands for Rapshila. I think it's it's Karastir. or Shaila Karastir. It's yeah. RSK, yeah. and they train young people or really anybody on how to budget accordingly. 
Uh-huh. Um, they, they originally were just paying off people's grocery bills. Uh-huh. Uh, this person has a max out grocery bill on this grocery. <coughs> and this person, uh-huh. and now they're they're training young people how to budget. Like, don't use credit cards if you can't afford to use a credit card. It's bad for you or stuff like that. Like, is poverty preventable? Is it preventable? So, who is doing in Claudius Roll the pre- the prevention work? Would you say? Do you know anybody? Um, I think I think people like uh, pe- people like Pesach Kroll and Yossi Jacobson that speak uh, that inspire people uh, yeah. and, and leave them in a, uh, an uplifted feeling, and that that uh, that chizuk that you get when you hear their chedushei Torah and you hear their inspiring words, it gives you an opportunity to transfer that to other parts uh, of your life. I think so. If you look at it from that vantage point, I, I think an attachment to some level of study of Torah is a way to. Uh, enhance other aspects of your life. It, it's it, very it general. Though. Over. It's, it's very. It's very general. You want a name of an organization? No, does, I mean like does somebody, happy work. Happy work. Yeah. What's happy work? <laughs> I don't know what happy work is. I don't know. Um, I don't know uh, an orchestra. Uh, you know the. Uh, I think prevention. Prevention is very important. Like if we know that X, the percentages of people who get bullied end up having severe, you know, mental health issues when it comes to shaduchim, then a prevention of bullying will then clear up the pipeline in the future so instead of instead of saying we have amazing resources for everyone who's been bullying and for everyone who has uh, these issues later on in life well could we get ahead of that could we prevent things like that happening well listen, like you say uh, you defense know, is the best offense right yeah it is, or offense is the best defense i don't know the, no Def- what's defense thing? Is the best uh, offense. vince lombardi who was the coach of the Green Bay Packers used to say, um, the best, the best defense is a good offense. The best defense is a good offense. If you score, if you're scoring four touchdowns, don't worry about your defense. Yeah, right. <laughs> if you're ahead twenty-eight nothing after the first quarter, don't worry about the defense so much. Yeah, you can have a mediocre defense. You'll do okay. You know. Yeah, so, absolutely. So um, I think that was. So our the, offense, we have to score more points. We have to get ahead. You know, we got to get ahead of these, cra- uh, uh, these but, crises. Uh, the, but the resistance is intense. Resistance. The resistance, then that's that. And, but my point is, that's the construction, that's the construction of the world, which brings us down to you know broader philosophical questions about why God needed to create this world. There's a billion planets, at least a billion planets out there, and those people that went up. In how space do you know planets, how many planets there are? I don't know. It's, that's what I read. Some people come over to me in shul. I read in space magazines. So, some people come over to me in shul. They're like, "How does your father have like this knowledge in his head? Like, where does he know these things from? What do I know? Like what? Give me an example. Like there are billions of planets." I said there are at least a billion planets. How do you know? Who comes over to your show and asks you questions <laughs> like that? <laughs> You're deflecting. <laughs> there are at least a billion planets. How do you know that? Scientists who, who study space. Which scientists you want their you speak? names? I want a name. Schwartz. <laughs> Schwartz is one of the scientists. I want to speak to Schwartz. There's a billion planets. Does he also make herring by any you chance? Know how, you know how big the universe The universe is, is, is infinite. Yeah. And they have this little Earth planet, which is 25,000 miles uh, totally. With two thirds of the planet is water, yeah. Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Mediterranean, Indian Ocean. Wild. So <laughs> one third is dry land where people live. And you know, David Melch said in in Tillam, w- 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 "What is man that you pay any attention to him? Yeah. What is our shaykhus to 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 God? Yeah, it's just to contemplate godliness. What our connection to it? And a lot of people think that they're you know even equal partners with God. Yeah, right. You know, some people even think that they control him." <laughs> Because after all, you could see us, but he's invisible. So if he was such a big shot, he wouldn't be invisible. you know. But we're not invisible. We can look in the mirror and see ourselves, but we can't see him. So how do I know these things? I don't know. I just I accumulate knowledge. I'm not saying I'm always right about it. Well, how about this? Did you know this story from JNS.org? That what? Israel trained <laughs> cattle to spy on Palestinian village, says the PA daily. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is some story. On the neck of each cow... They hang a medallion with an ear eavesdropping and recording device and sometimes cameras in order to monitor every detail in a Palestinian village. Um, Why do they need that if they have satellite images? A, you know? a Palestinian village elder fabricated a story yeah. about Israeli livestock participating in spying activity with the official yeah, Palestinian authority. What's that? Is this story fake? Uh, they make up a lot of stories. Uh, the I mean, Arab side is very propaganda-oriented. Uh, and they get away with it because they have a very gullible press that is uh, <laughs> that are very anxious for anything that sheds a bad light on Israel. That's unbelievable. So the story I think is like I yeah, think it's this crazy. is it's a, it's a, it's a, if you how have, do you train cattle? 
To Not see, far. I was I, I, a couple of years ago. I was in a in a um, in in a, in a in a an Air Force uh, base in Israel. Oh, I thought you were in the Air Force. I was in, in Rehovot, and I went to a special section that works on drones. Yeah, they launch drones, pilotless drones. They yeah. can go. They launch, launch them over Gaza constantly. They can see into people's uh, bathrooms. Yeah, they can see what color tile they have on the walls. They can see anything they want. They need cows with cameras around their necks. I wouldn't put that past the Israelis, <laughs> though. That's like very Israeli, no? Uh, I don't know. You have, you have like a cattle that they trained. Like, what do you think the what do you think the other cattle like think about? That cattle, like uh, oh, he's the. He, I don't know. I don't, he's the cop. I, one thing I tell you, I don't, I don't know about the thought process of cattle. That's one thing you don't know. I, I don't think that they have a. a, speak a Schwartz. In, in, I don't think they have an intelligent, intellectual thought process. They're behemoths, you yeah. know. Yeah. They they just they would just want to eat grass. It's kind of the thing that we have over them. Is they just want to eat grass all day long. You know why a cow is very satisfied eating? You ever see a cow eat grass or a horse eat grass? Yeah. You, you I have. see that? <laughs> yeah. You have? Have you? They, but you see how they eat it with such gusto? Yeah, they're, they're very, this is their, you know their top your, your brother-in-law, who's a farmer, Eliezer, mm -hmm. Eliezer Franklin, told me that in the human mouth, when you, let's say you have ice cream, you like ice cream? Sometimes. Okay, if you like chocolate ice cream, let's say you love the taste of chocolate, you put a chocolate in your mouth, a person, a human being has eight taste buds in their mouth. Eight? Eight. Eight. Seems like a little... Out. Yeah, you know how much a, you know how much a cow has in his mouth. What fourteen thousand taste buds? When they taste that grass, wow! What they're tasting, it's just you can't you can't get to there. You can't get there. The, you, you, I've watched cows eat grass. How about foodies? Do they have more than eight <laughs> taste buds? Maybe like the maybe kosher food and wine. Maybe expo? twelve. Maybe twelve. Four, uh, twelve to fourteen. Maybe thousand. Like <laughs> those, they love food so much. No, but they the foodies might have the camera around their neck. I think. Oh yeah. In the restaurants, <laughs> that's why you get all these videos on yeah. Instagram. From from the restaurants. Yeah. So this headline uh, via Arat Sheva, um, pray for good news. Search for Moshe Kleinerman to focus on a specific area. So it's been over f uh, 250 days. Um, I don't know. Maybe How's even it? more. Yeah, I think it, uh, was it after, it was after Lagba Omer? Lagba Omer. Or Moshe Kleinerman, a young, I think 15, 16 year old boy, right? just disappeared. And police have been searching for him ever since. They they seem to have find some you know, DNA evidence in certain places. They're searching in the Mayron area. And they've been looking. Um, his family is, is urging for the, if the public knows anything. They're not sure if he was abducted. They're not sure if he ran away. And we're, we, we certainly are not going to speculate what happens because what happened because we, we don't know. Uh, but, you know, we if just want to. If he would have had a cell phone, he could have called him. Oh, Abba. Yeah. <laughs> taking that out. <laughs> we, we, we just don't know where, where he is. Uh, the Israel Dog Unit, a nonprofit organization that specializes in search and rescue operations and locating missing people, uh, has been approached by Israel police and asked to search a specific area in the north. Uh, following a request from the local police, teams from the Israel Dog Unit will be continuing the search this morning for the missing boy, Moshe Kleinerman. IDU wow. spokes, spokesman Aaron Streicher said, our search operation today will be focused on a specific area Let's pray for good news, and that's what we should do. You know, we, we hope that so this... So what do they think? think he's in a cave somewhere, in a field? He's living someplace. He's alive. If he wasn't alive, I think they would have found him. Yeah. You know? So so we, we, we don't know. Uh, we we hope that we hear good news. We have to dive in for good news that they find Mocha Klein. I mean, it's been right. so long. A lot of a lot of press, you know, surrounded this, this, this topic and this boy, and hopefully there's a safe... A safe uh, Good, good reunion good, happy, with him and his happy family ending, happy conclusion so um, as someday. we as we wind down this episode um and i'll i'll give you an opportunity as well because today's thursday and this week's partial of um yes. there's something really really cool that i f i found online which i didn't find everyone's been using it nowadays not everyone you know some people have been using it and i wanted to to read a Devar Torah that this wrote for me okay so i think i'm about to really mess up everybody's who wrote it for you it's, uh, our artificial intelligence wrote this for me. Okay. Something called chat GPT. I think it's called. It's AI. What's AI? Ask your parents. It's artificial intelligence. Actually, don't ask your parents because they're definitely not going to know what the, what this is. I think it's as good as Israel. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe, it's, yeah, maybe it's as good as Israel. Maybe, uh, maybe they're behind it. Taka. What is AI? AI is what? All so intelligence? It's this app that I went to and yeah. it's, uh, it's called chat uh, GPT. And I typed in... Uh, Give me a give me a, a Dvar Torah on Parshas Vayechi. Okay, and you can really write anything, and it'll give you. It, really? it, it basically, I think it scours the internet. What's the name of the app? Chat GPT. It scours the internet for for just information, and really? it put together this amazing Dvar Torah. I'm gonna read it right now. 
Let me hear. So we crossed the border. One of our first projects uh, was the development. Oh, whoa, 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 let me start over. Wrong thing. Wrong thing. Okay. Take so two. I want to read this. This. Uh, this. This. Dvar Torah wrote up. So in the final in the final chapter of the book of Bracious, we find that Yaakov is lying on his deathbed. He's blessing his children. And Yaakov's last words teaches us a powerful lesson about the power of legacy and our ability to positively impact future generation. He tells his children, Hashem has been with me. He guarded me wherever I went. The idea of being protected by Hashem is often viewed as being literal. Hashem protects us from harm and danger. Yet Yaakov broadened this concept and viewed Hashem's protection from a spiritual standpoint. Yaakov was not just physically protected by Hashem. He was guided through life and provided with strength, developed the spiritual gifts needed, needed to lead and impact future generations. Yaakov reminds us that our mission in life is to, is to strive to create a spiritual and moral, and moral legacy. We must actively work to use our strengths to shape our children and future generations in a positive manner. Just as Yaakov was spiritually protected by Hashem, we should be assured that as we strive to construct our legacy, Hashem will guide us and protect us along the way. Now, this was was written by Chad AI, but by uh, Chad, Chad GPT. GPT. And it's like, I was I was skeptical. I thought they're going to give me some hijibiji Biji Dvar Torah. That was a beautiful Dvar Torah that they wrote up. So teachers, be aware, if your fourth grader comes in with a beautifully written essay that has no spelling mistakes, has perfect grammar, be a little, be a little, uh, a little suspicious. suspicious, you think? Yeah. Well, listen, you know, I, I lived, uh, I, when I was in high school many years ago, I a think few they, years ago. They just started the, you were, for the first time, you were able to use a calculator on the regions, on the math regions. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Yeah. And before that, we took regions in ninth and 10th grade. Yeah, to show your work. We took regions without a calculator. I can't imagine. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what, a, what an advantage it is to have a calculator on your desk? Absolutely. You're doing math? Yeah. Uh, the people that uh, did it without calculators really knew their stuff. Uh-huh. So what do you got on partial Anyway, what well, I wanted to say, that this is a verse for this is a great, this is probably one of the most pivotal pivotal parshas uh, in the Torah. Uh, when Clay is rose transitioning from uh, just coming into Mitzrayim, they're going to go into slavery and... From slavery, they're going to be there for 210 years, and Moshe Rabbeinu is going to be born, and they're going to be led to Har Sinai, and then ultimately into Eretz Yisrael. So we're at the cusp, yeah. at the threshold of great historical uh, happenings. And like you say, Yaakov Avinu was giving brachas to the Shvatim before he passes away. So two things I want to point out. Number one, he he blesses uh, Yehuda, who is known as the strongest, powerful of the most uh, of the Shvatim, but he blesses him that. His enemies are going to see the back of his neck. Uh, he's going to see the. He's going to see his, the back of the neck of his enemies, which means his enemies are going to flee from him. And why is that important? Because at the end of the midbar, when before when Moshe Rabbeinu is not sure whether he's going into Eretz Yisrael or not, he has an argument with Shevet God and Shevet Ruvain uh, about they want to stay in Eber Yardin with his better farmland for their sheep. And, but they're the great, they're the best fighters. He wants them to lead Klal Yisrael and Eretz Yisrael. But so why is Moshe Rabbeinu giving Gud and Ruvain a hard time about not leading the fight to capture Eretz Yisrael when we know Yehuda is the leader of the Jewish people mm-hmm. and the and the greatest uh, you know military person? And you go back to Parshas Vayechi where it says that Yehuda is going to see the back of the neck of his enemies, which means that. His enemies are going to run away. They're going to live to see another day. They're going to run away. You need Gud and Ruve to know how to win. They know how to defeat the enemy. You know how to defeat them uh, definitively. So that's number one. Number two, I just want to say that you have the the, the brachas are dispensed by Yaakov Avinu in chronological order. Ruve, Shimon, Levi, so on and so forth. And then, he, and then instead of Yisacha and Zvulun, he says Zvulun first and Yisacha second. So he switches the order. Now it's known that Zvulun is a businessman. Uh, who's on the on the high seas doing business, trading, whatever they do, and Yisachar Yosef Ohel, they sit in Kolel, they sit in Yeshiva, and they learn. So it's a little cynical to say that because Zvulun uh, provides the money for the guys that are learning, yeah. that he goes first when Yisachar is really older than Zvulun. So Lubavitch Rebbe says that that's not really the case, and you see it again. It possess the bracha when Moshe Rabbeinu is dispensing the brachas. No, the the pshat is that. Zvulun has a double opportunity to do a Kiddush Hashem when he's in the base medrash, davening and learning, and when he's at work. He can be Makad Hashem Shemayim. Yisacha, he's Makad Hashem Shemayim when he's in shul, in the morning davening, and when he's learning the entire day, and when he goes back to Menchemah every night. But Zvulun, like I said, has a double opportunity. That's why he went 
uh, before uh, Yisachar. You can uh, uh, honor, uh, honor godliness uh, when he's in shul in the morning and when he's learning with his chavrusa and when he's at work during the day. That is amazing. Uh, and we hope you all have a beautiful Shabbos. Yes, if you're going to be at the Hask concert, I will be there, God willing. I hope to see you there, Hask 36. This if you want some VIP passes, I think you still head to hask36.com this Sunday. Um, and I'll see you there. I can't wait. But other than that, have an amazing great weekend. Shabbos. Have a great Shabbos. And we'll see you next week.